Welcome to the NWAETC Project ECHO. I'm Kent Unruh, and I'd like to turn it over to Dr. Brian Wood, our medical director, to introduce our guest. A big thanks to Laura, uh, Abby and Ada Cruz, for joining us. Laura is a licensed social worker and program manager at Alaska Native Epidemiology Center. She has a big focus on relationship abuse, including domestic violence and sexual abuse, and has done a lot of work supporting providers in that arena and creating resources, and we're very lucky to have her join us today. So l last week, we covered the first two. The first two learning objectives describing both how intimate partner violence and sexual violence are a significant cause for STI and HIV risk, and also a consequence of being positive. So what we'll focus on today is how to reduce risks and improve our response to, um, to a relationship abuse. And so the, the components of this is how to do both universal preventative um, education and assessment as well as targeted um, education and assessment for patients. And then re recognizing elevated risk of partner notification and potentially treatment and how to reduce some risks um, as well as reduce risks of other risks of intimate partner violence and sexual violence, such as unintended pregnancies. So the point of assessment, um, or screening as it's most often called, is not about making patients disclose. It's about reducing their isolation, um, because we know that in abuse, isolation is a, is a key component. It's about reducing their isolation, letting them know they're not alone, and improving those options for safety. So how do we do this? First, by creating a safe environment in which they can talk about their concerns with you, and then through integrating education education with assessment response. So the first most important step for a safe environment is privacy. We, you know, we have to see patients alone. Creating a policy that for this, creating signage for this makes your job a lot easier as a provider so that you don't have to ask a controlling partner to leave the room. It's just policy. It's just the way we practice here. Other things you can do, there are many things you can do to create a trauma-informed physical environment, but one thing is to send positive messages with posters, decorations, etc., uh, safety cards, um, and these are just a few examples. Once you have the patient in the room alone, the first step is to review confidentiality. And I, and I imagine that as HIV providers, you have a, a strong practice of this. This is not necessarily universally practiced throughout medicine and healthcare. It is a key component of victim advocacy and behavioral health. So the reviewing both what you will keep confidential and what what, what are the limits of confidentiality and, and doing that according to your state laws if you don't if you feel like your staff aren't necessarily um, very well versed in the state laws, you can usually get a training from your local victim advocacy agency in those. And so the point of reviewing confidentiality is it builds trust and, and talking about how you have to maintain confidentiality can remove fears that patients have about gossip or reporting of drug use or other things. They don't necessarily know that you can't share that information more broadly. But talking about the limits of confidentiality avoids them being blindsided by a mandated report that they weren't expecting. So it it lets them still be in control rather than taking that control away from them when they open up and trust you to then have a report that they weren't warned about. So it's really important that we that we, want, that we tell them the limits beforehand. So then I'm going to talk about kind of after you've gotten the patient alone and reviewed confidentiality, what is the patient safety card approach? Um, how do we integrate education and assessment? So the safety card is something that was created by Futures Without Violence. The last slide was a perinatal safety card. This one is a card that was developed in partnership with some tribal sites, and this is actually a gender-neutral card about healthy sexuality. And the, the idea of this, and it's been researched um, by Dr. Elizabeth Miller in concert with them, is, is that whether a patient wants to disclose or not um, in that visit, they still walk away with resources. They still walk away with positive messages and resources, and it's effective. And so in Alaska, we created some two locally appropriate, culturally appropriate versions of these cards um, that we brought to villages and towns all over Alaska, got feedback from 110 girls and women on this card with, with resources on it. And this is actually, although we created this in Alaska and the version I'm showing you here has a gnome shelter phone number on it, there's a national version of it that doesn't say Alaska anywhere and it's perfectly uh, useful for anyone in the lower 48. It covers a number of things, how relationships affect health, 
um, healthy and unhealthy relationships, including uh, people's rights to their body and their sexual rights, and that if they're sexually assaulted, it's not their fault and that they can get help. Also, due to popular demand, we created a gender-neutral teen safety card for Alaska, and this is with feedback from 113 youth all over Alaska, rural and urban, um, and including high-risk populations like youth in detention. And this covers, this covers issues like healthy relationships, unhealthy relationships, and it, and it speaks both to potential victims and potential perpetrators. So we're trying to reach youth as part of universal prevention and education as well as targeted intervention. It discusses what healthy intimacy is, what consent is, how to n make sure that you have consent. Again, it discusses your rights to your body, what it is you have a right to, and um, how to get help, and that it's not your fault if someone assaults you. Also, it talks a little bit about commercial ex sexual exploitation of children, um, trafficking, which we know is a major risk factor for sexually transmitted infections, and a few other topics I, I didn't show. You can order both these cards on our website, and the Getting Together card does say Alaska in a few places. If you would like to modify it for your state, I'd be happy to give you the original to modify. We're happy to share. And you can order all of the national cards on Futures Without Violence websites, as well as all of their other resources. What do you do with the card? The, the card also helps to normalize the conversation, to introduce the conversation. I'll give you a, a funny story. My colleague went to get a yearly and they said, oh, we're giving this card, and it was a national card, we're giving this card to patients about, abu it's about abusive relationships. And my colleague said, oh, well then I don't need it. I'm not in an abusive relationship. Um, and so it was a missed opportunity there. The point of normalizing is that you're not putting terms up in the way. Um, you're actually just introducing it like, for example, with the teen card, you know, we're giving this card to all of our all of the youth who come into the clinic. It's kind of like an online quiz. It talks about healthy and unhealthy relationships and intimacy. So I'll give you a chance to read it. Or you can read it with them. For younger teens, that's particularly important, but it can be helpful to review it with the patient. So the point of this is to let them know that they're not being singled out or judged. You're not asking them these questions because you think that they look like someone who, who would be abused. You're just asking them because it's a, un, it's a public health issue. And so that lets them know they're not alone in experiencing it. And again, those terms can be barriers, so we're not saying this is a card about domestic violence. We're saying it's a card about relationships, because everyone has relationships. And so you can use this card uh, as a screening tool in the way that's shown here, kind of where you go over it with them and then ask if any of these things are an issue in their life. You could also um, ask the questions in the card, or you could use, the, use it um, in, as an introduction before asking using a standardized screening tool such as the Relationship Assessment Tool, RAT, or other tools. But the point is that uh, you know, those screening tools alone don't build that relationship and let them know why they should trust you and doesn't let them walk away with something regardless of whether they disclose or not. It's also important to ask certain visit-specific questions based on why they're coming to you that day um, or the kind of visit. So these are some examples of, of how to offer anyone who comes in for emergency contraception, you know, because it happens to so many girls and women, we ask if someone's been trying to get them pregnant when they didn't want to be. So again, you're saying this is a public health issue, this happens to a lot of people, you're not alone, I care about your answer. So you're just introducing, you're using that preparatory language to let them know what you're going to do with the information if they share it with you. It, right, so anytime patients come in for STI testing, we ask if they feel comfortable talking with their partners about using condoms or if their partners will get mad. Are you able to talk with your partner about using condoms without feeling afraid? And so that's an important question to assess, you know, the reasons why they may not be using condoms or engaging in other high-risk behaviors. It may not just be, you know, their choices. They may, they may not be able to make sexual choices in their relationship. And so that's an important assessment. There are two resources that you can go to on Future Without Violence websites. The, these are two publications that have a lot more information on these specific, uh, visit specific screening questions, response, etc. So this, and, and there's also a train the trainer guide with DVDs, with, with slides and vignettes, and then this as well for adolescent patients that comes with um, vignette, video vignettes and slides. So responding, what do you do? One of the big barriers to asking is that providers are often afraid of getting a yes and not knowing how to respond. One thing is that if they say no, nothing is happening, it's still an opportunity to, to keep the door open and engage them. So, you know, I'm really glad nothing like that's happening for you. We're giving this card, if, if it's safe for you to take this card, you can take as many as you want for your friends and family, right? And, you can, and if anything changes, you're, you can always come back and talk to me. 
So, and, and what they found in the randomized control trial they're doing on the cards is that uh, people are taking multiple cards because they want to share them with their friends and family. And then if someone says yes, it's an opportunity to validate and support. This doesn't have to take a long time. I know that's the fear is once I open Pandora's box, then the patient will be there all day and I won't be able to see my other patients. But um, there are ways of validating and supporting people um, in a short amount of time. And, and it helps. So I'm, simple things like, I'm so sorry this is happening in your life. You, know, you don't deserve this. It's not your fault. Um, that sounds really stressful or that sounds really scary. Right? People need empathy and people need to know that they're not making this up because abusive partners often say, you know, you're crazy, you're making this up. And so to validate their experience uh, and to thank them for telling you because it really is a brave thing for them to do to share that with you. You can also, one thing in, in advocacy, we always say you don't want to should on people or you don't want to should all over people and tell them what to do. You don't want to take their control away. Um, but you can offer information and offer concern. So, you know, I want you to know you have the right to, to require a condom every time or I'm, I'm really concerned about how this is affecting your health and, and then help make that connection between what they're experiencing and the symptoms they're experiencing as we talked about last time. So some health and safety issues to consider if you are working with a female patient um, who has heterosexual, uh, who has male sexual partners, um, are long-acting reversible contraceptives as a very effective form of, of contraception, um, especially if she's experiencing, if she's not able to negotiate condom use or experiencing reproductive coercion. Some issues though with LARCs is in choosing which one to use or in helping the patient choose which one to use, you wanna ask questions, does the partner monitor menstruation? Because most of these affect um, her menstruation. The only one that doesn't is the Paragard. Can, patient, can the patient return to clinic for Depo-Provera shots? Is that going to be a safe method that she'll be able to continue? Is her partner going to feel the IUD strings you can offer to cut them, right? Is the partner going to feel the next Nexplanon? You would wanna safety plan with the patient um, about these issues. Issues. If you're offering emergency contraception or even uh, treatment uh, medications, um, using an unidentifiable envelope might be safer for the patient if the partner doesn't want that patient to have those. In terms of treatment and partner notification, uh, if you are, if you do expedited partner therapy, right, ask about the safety of that. Is it safe for you to tell your partner that you have an STI? Is it safe for you to bring treatment to your partner? Um, it, would it be safer if the health department called and, you know, it made an anonymous notification? And then if they are going to talk with their partner, you can offer to do some safety planning or connect them with a victim advocate who can do some safety planning around that. And then in terms of treatment options, as we talked about last time, HIV, abuse can be a barrier to effective treatment, to get returning to the clinic for treatment. And so looking at treatment options that work with, in, the, in the situation that they're in, whether they're going to be going to shelter or staying in an abusive relationship, um, think about treatment options that work with that. And in advocacy, we say, you know, nothing without us or something, sorry, nothing about us without us. And so you're doing this planning with your patient. Other issues to consider is, is the abuse affecting other chronic conditions that they have, other comorbidities? Um, is the patient denying them medication or treatment? Do they need to hide their medication and treatment? And then include that, encourage them to include that in safety planning with an advocate. In terms of referrals, so the cards have numbers on them. That's great, you wanna give that to them, but we know that um, the most effective way to get someone into, treat, into um, support services if they want them is to offer it um, in a supported, warm way. So the more that you know your local domestic violence agency, the more that you've called them and, and figured out what it's like when you talk with someone, the better you can um, introduce that to them and offer to let them use the clinic phone so that it's not on their uh, you know, on their cell phone call list that their partner could find. So, you know, if it's okay with you, we could use, I'm not an expert in relationships, but I have some colleagues over at XYZ agency who are, um, if you'd like, we can call them here in the clinic phone and they can think through some ways to stay safe. Would you like me to do that? So just as a closing, every, every patient, we don't know who's being abused. We don't know who has been or will be abused. So every patient is an opportunity to provide messages, education that they may not have ever heard. They may not know what a healthy relationship is. It's an opportunity for positive prevention education and also for, to potentially to let someone know that they're not alone anymore, that you're there, that you care, and that um, there are resources for them. All right, so thank you very much.